the Reserve Bank, Michelle Bullock. She's been in the role for about three months now, and I reckon that every day since she's taken it on, either she or the RBA has been in the media spotlight. It is possibly the most scrutinised public role in Australia right now, and we're thrilled to welcome her for her first annual payments address. Many of you will already be familiar with the Governor's work because she has a very strong background in payments. Ms Bullock has held a number of senior management roles within the RBA, including Head of the Payments Policy Department and Assistant, Assistant Governor for Financial Systems, Business Services and Currency. And before this current role, she was Deputy Governor of the RBA. Before we welcome Ms Bullock to the stage, just a quick note regarding your questions. The purpose of today's speech is to talk about payments policy, not monetary policy. As much as we would all love to dig around in there, especially our friends from the media. So uh, please submit your questions on payments via the QR code and we'll get to as many as possible and payments questions will uh, receive priority. But now please welcome the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Ms Michelle Bullock. Thank you, Anita. Um, thanks, John, for the invitation to be here. Um, payments, I love payments, and um, I'm in a room of like-minded people, so I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here. So, as John's also talked about, the payments landscape is changing rapidly. We've got new business models, we've got te new technologies entering the space. The industry's moving from legacy systems towards new platforms that can deliver payment systems that are faster, safer, and more convenient for everyone. We therefore need to modernise our regulatory architecture and payments infrastructure to support these innovations. And we've been working with the government to update the regulatory framework. This morning I'm going to talk through how the Payment System Board is responding to this changing environment. I've got a slide, yep. Um, I'll begin by highlighting the Board's strategic priorities through this period of change. And then I'm going to focus on three issues for 2024. Um, the RBA's plan to undertake a comprehensive review of retail payments regulation under its expanded regulatory perimeter, how industry and government can work together to maintain access to cash, and how to ensure a successful transition from BECS to modern payment systems. Now, the Payment System Board recently... There we go. The Payment System Board recently refreshed its strategic priorities given the changes in the payment system and the regulatory landscape. We set them out in the Payment System Board annual report for 2023. You can see the priorities here. The first is to strengthen the resilience of Australia's payments and markets infrastructures. Businesses and consumers are more reliant on electronic payment systems than ever before, with outages becoming increasingly disruptive to everyday life. We're therefore up, um, going to um, step up our oversight of these systems, particularly the new payments platform and the card schemes. The second priority is to advance and implement the government's payments reforms. These reforms will modernise the regulatory architecture and they'll ensure that the RBA can continue to promote a safe, efficient and competitive payment system. The third priority is to promote competitive, cost-effective and accessible electronic payments. Consumers and businesses are benefiting from new payments technologies that are more flexible and easier to use. But greater use of these electronic methods is also adding to payment costs for businesses. We expect payment service providers to help merchants lower their payment costs by implementing least cost routing. We also expect financial institutions to deliver more fast payment capabilities to consumers and businesses through the NPP. In particular, NPP's Pay2 service will help to modernise how we make direct debits, giving customers greater visibility and control over these payments. And in fact, when I entered payments in 1998, direct debits and lack of control over them, that was the number one problem for consumers. And here we are only finally starting to address it. The fourth priority is to enhance cross-border payments. So Australia is working with other G20 countries to make cross-border payments cheaper, faster, more transparent and more accessible. One key initiative here is standardising the messages associated with cross-border payments. So what information is mandatory for such payments, what is optional and how is it presented in the message. 
I recently chaired an international working group that developed harmonised messaging standards for cross-border payments. And the aim is to implement these requirements globally by 2027. The operators of systems that process cross-border payments in Australia have publicly stated their intention to meet these requirements on that timeline. We expect financial institutions to also be ready to use the standardised messaging by 2027 so their customers can enjoy more seamless cross-border payments. Another key initiative in this space is the NPP's International Business Payments Service, which will allow the Australian dollar leg of in inbound cross-border payments to be processed via the NPP on a real-time 24-7 basis. This service was due to be implemented by all NPP participants this month, but some of them are not ready, which is disappointing. We expect the Australian payments industry to deliver on this commitment as soon as possible. Our fifth strategic priority is to shape the future of money in Australia. Now this year, many of you would know, we completed a research project that explored the potential use cases for a central bank digital currency. Building on this, we're now planning a project that will examine how different forms of digital money and infrastructure could support the development of tokenised asset markets in Australia. And we're looking forward to in continuing our engagement with the industry on this work. We're also continuing to work closely with Treasury in exploring the policy case for a central bank digital currency in Australia. And we expect to release a joint paper by mid-24, which will take stock of CBDC anal analysis in Australia so far and lay out a roadmap for future work. Now, within these strategic priorities, there are three key issues that I highlighted that are going to be particularly important in 2024, and I'm going to talk about those now. One of the key projects under our second strategic priority, that is advance and implement the reforms, is a comprehensive review of our retail payments regulation. The Reserve Bank's regulatory remit will soon be expanded as part of the government's payments reforms, and you'll hear from me on some, some of that later. Specifically, the Payment Systems Regulation Act, which was enacted in 1998, is being amended to ensure that newer payers in the payment system including buy now, pay later providers, payment gateways, payment facilitators, mobile wallet providers, all of these can be regulated by the RBA. We expect these reforms to be in place sometime in 2024, at which point we will launch a holistic review of, the re of retail payments regulation. This is going to be an opportunity to consult on current regulation, as well as on areas where regulation might be required in the, instance, in the interests of safety competition and efficiency. And this will help us to set our regulatory priorities in the expanded regulatory perimeter. The RBA's payments regulation over the past couple of decades has been shaped by some key principles that have helped promote safe, efficient and competitive markets. These include the cost of payment services should be clear for businesses and consumers because transparency helps to promote competition. Businesses should be free to choose which payment methods they accept. And businesses should be able to pass on the cost of the payment methods sh chosen by end users. Some initial questions for the review are whether these principles are still sufficient and how to apply them to the wider range of payment systems and participants that will fall within the RBA's expanded regulatory perimeter. I think I've gone the wrong way. The review will also focus on some specific issues. So, and they're shown on this slide. The first is least cost routing. This is important because it puts competitive pressure on card payment schemes to lower fees to merchants. Now, while some progress has been made to enable LCR for businesses, it's been slow. So formal regulation may be required to get acquirers and other service providers to deliver the full benefits of LCR to businesses. The second specific issue is mobile wallets. Usage of mobile wallets, as you all know, has grown very rapidly, but the costs associated with these services remain opaque and payment service providers can face barriers to access. We'll need to consider whether regulatory action is needed in this area. And the final area is buy now, pay later services. 
In previous reviews, we've concluded that merchants should have the right to surcharge buy now, pay later services, which are an expensive means of payment, and this is just as they have the right to surcharge card payments. So the right to surcharge for payment methods provides an important incentive for payment schemes to keep their fees low. Formal regulation may be required to allow this. So as part of this holistic review, we'll look forward to engaging constructively with the industry and many of you on all of these issues. We also remain focused on access to cash for Australians. This, issue, this has received some attention in the press recently and I suspect it's going to get a lot more and I'd like to provide some context on this and discuss the work that's underway. So the use of cash in payments has been declined for many years as consumers have switched to digital payments. So the share of consumer payments made during cash declined from 70% in 2007 when we did our first survey of payments and it declined to 13% in 2022. That was when our latest consumer payment survey was conducted. Now, despite, despite this decline, cash does remain an important method of payment for some people, and it's widely held as a precautionary or store of wealth sort of uh, means. Cash is also an important backup method during system outages or natural disasters when um, electronic payments might be unavailable. I had no sympathy for my son when his card didn't work and he had no cash on him at the petrol station, for example. For these reasons, the RBA places a high priority on the community continuing to have reasonable access to cash withdrawal and deposit services. Now, the government has also highlighted the importance of maintaining adequate access to cash services as a key priority in its strategic plan for the payment system. Now, the challenge we face is that as the tra transactional use of cash declines, it's affecting the economics of providing cash services and it's putting pressure on the cash distribution system. These challenges prompted the RBA to launch a review of banknote distribution arrangements in 2021, which we sought to identify changes to make the distribution system more eff effective, efficient, sustainable and resilient. The review made some recommendations focusing on areas where the RBA has direct relationship with industry to improve transparency and to support industry input into distribution arrangements. However, the review also acknowledged that the changes in themselves would be unlikely to fundamentally reshape the medium-term economics of the industry. The challenging economics of cash distribution was one of the main factors behind the recent merger of the two largest cash in transit providers, Linfox Armagard and Prosiga, which the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission approved earlier this year. The merger was approved subject to a three-year undertaking from the firms regarding pricing and service levels. As part of this, Linfox Armagard gave an undertaking to continue supplying CIT services to existing customers until 2026. Now, the merger was intended to address the structural decline and overcapacity in the CIT industry and reduce the risk of one or both of the CIT companies suddenly exiting the industry, which would cause a lot of disruption in the availability of cash in the economy. Now, despite the merger having taken place as proposed, Linfox Armagard is now indicating that its CIT business continues to be unsustainable. Given these issues, the RBA recently convened a round table discussion with industry participants to discuss what more could be done to promote the sustainability of the cash distribution system. These discussions are ongoing and industry, regulators and government will need to continue to work together to put in place sustainable arrangements for cash distribution. I'd have to say that many other countries are facing similar challenges associated with declining transactional use of cash. There's been a range of policy and even legislative responses contemplated overseas, including measures to maintain cash access and acceptance and to shore up wholesale cash distribution arrangements. We'll continue to monitor closely the developments overseas through the diversity of policy options being considered, suggests that solutions tailored to Australian circumstances are going to be required here. In terms of wholesale distribution arrangements, one model that has been considered in some countries is a utility in which a number of organisations form a single entity to carry out the wholesale cash distribution function. 
Utility models aim to share fixed costs among the participants and achieve efficiencies. Though cooperative arrangements, I'd have to say, can also be challenging to implement, as we know. There are examples overseas where industry was unable to reach consensus on moving to a utility structure, and legislative options to address risks to cash access have therefore been pursued. Nevertheless, it may be worth exploring the merits of a cooperative arrangement in Australia. To facilitate the development of options to put the cash distribution system on a more sustainable footing, the Australian Banking Association recently applied to the ACCC for authorisation to develop in principle solutions to the challenges facing the cash distribution industry. The ACCC has granted interim authorisation for the ABA and other stakeholders to discuss these issues and the RBA will also be involved in these discussions. The declining use of cash is also challenging the provision of retail cash services. This has been evident in the significant reduction in the number of cash access points over recent years, including ATMs and bank branches. Despite this, the distance people need to travel to access cash services has been little changed in recent years, but this may not be the case in the future if access points continue to decline. ATMs remain the preferred means for accessing cash for most Australians. The RBA regulates pricing aspects of the ATM industry via an access regime. These regulatory arrangements were introduced in 2009 to promote competition in the ATM industry at a time when cash was much more heavily used. We recently consulted industry participants on the future of the access framework, given the substantial changes to the industry since 2009. The feedback was that the access regime still plays a useful role in protecting fair access and promoting competition in the industry. So based on this, we've decided to retain the access regime. However, we have recognised the ongoing challenges the industry faces from declining cash and ATM use and the rising costs of deployment. We're keen to see the industry maintaining a broad coverage of ATMs at reasonable prices, particularly in regional and remote areas. So we're going to continue to engage with industry participants to determine whether any changes are required to the RBA's regulation of the ATM industry to facilitate this. Now the final issue I'd like to discuss is the industry's plan to transition from the bulk, elect clearing, bulk electronic clearing system, as we commonly know and fondly know as BECS, direct entry, to more modern payment systems. BEX has been a low-cost, reliable workhorse for the payment system for decades, processing salary and welfare payments, recurring payments to merchants and other account-to-account -account transfers. In 2022-23, BEX processed around three-quarters of non-cash payments by value and it's still heavily relied on by many businesses and government agencies. Since the NPP was launched in 2018, Account-to-account -account transfers have been migrating across to the fast payment system, with around 30% of account-to-account -account transfers now made over the NPP. The payments industry through AusPayNet has been discussing whether to transition away from BECS and has recently decided to retire the BECS framework with a target end date of 2030. We understand why the industry wants to wind down BECS, Apart from the cost of maintaining the system, it has limitations compared with more modern alternatives such as the NPP. It processes payments in batches only on business days, compared with 24-7 operation of the NPP with funds transferred in close to real time. BEX isn't able to send complete remittance information. As many of you know, maybe not some of the younger ones of you, the limited number of characters stems from the number of characters that could be carried on a punch card in the old computing days. Decades on, this is clearly no longer fit for purpose. It prevents automating the reconciliation of payments and it makes it harder to screen for financial crimes. The NPP uses data-rich ISO 20022 messaging format, which is the new global standard for payment systems. Payments through BEX can only be addressed using BSB and account numbers. By contrast, the NPP incorporates the Pay ID addressing service, allowing payments to be addressed to an email address or a phone number, and it also provides a confirmation of payee service. These features can help to reduce mistaken payments and combat some scams, but not all. 
The limitation of BECs are becoming more significant as users expect fast payments and the economy becomes increasingly digital. But there are significant challenges to be overcome. If, we need to if we're going to successfully transition BECs payments to more modern payment systems. The first is that financial institutions need to connect all relevant accounts that currently send and receive payments via BECs to the NPP. Some financial institutions still haven't connected to the NPP, while others that have connected have not made all their accounts reachable. Until all accounts are connected, it'll be difficult for companies and governments to migrate existing payments, such as payroll, to the NPP. Completing this will take considerable investment and time. So it's important that work begins now to ensure that end users are not disrupted when BEX is retired. We're monitoring industry progress on making accounts reachable via the NPP. We're also engaging with institutions that are not yet connected to discuss their plans to make NPP services available to their customers. Another key issue is cost. We hear from users that processing payments through BEX is significantly cheaper than processing them through the NPP, especially for regular payments such as payroll. Employers are typically making such payments every couple of weeks, sometimes for thousands of employees, so the cost of every individual transaction can really add up here. We expect that as the volume of payments processed by NPP rises, the per transaction cost will come down. It's also important to recognise that there are some less visible costs associated with BEX payments. That includes manual reconciliation and, mis and managing mistaken payments, given BEX's limited messaging and addressing capabilities. Given the mandate of the Payment System Board to promote safety, efficiency and competition in the payment system, we plan to take an end, uh, a undertake a review of end user costs of account to account payments through BEX and the NPP to provide more transparency. Financial institutions will also need to ensure that their NPP services can be reli reliably handle the full range of payments that are currently processed by BEX. An um, important milestone has been the launch of NPP's Pay2 service as a modern alternative to direct debits. Most NPP participants have now enabled Pay2 for retail customers, but there's more work to do to make the service widely available to business payee customers looking to use Pay2 as an alternative to direct debits. Another important BEX use case is bulk payments, such as salaries and welfare payments, which are currently processed as, ba as batch files through BEX. The industry is going to need to find a way to efficiently process bulk payments through the NPP, which operates on a line-by-line -line rather than a batch basis. Many businesses and government agencies have bulk payment capabilities, and it's going to take time and effort for them to enable these payments to be processed by the MPP. Given the common challenge here, there may be value in developing a standardised industry approach to processing bulk payments through the MPP. This could promote interoperability, efficiency, competition in processing bulk payments, and give businesses and government entities more time to transition their systems. Financial institutions will also need to uplift their processing capacity to ensure BEX payment volumes can be reliably processed through NPP. Australian Payments Plus has built cap a capacity uplift into their roadmap. Further capacity upgrades are likely to be required in coming years. Another challenge is the reliability of NPP services provided by financial institutions. We collect data from financial institutions on the reliability of various retail payment services they provide. And these data show a substantial rise in the number and total duration of operational outages in recent years, with NPP services being the least reliable. As more volume shifts from BEX to NPP, it's important that providers improve the reliability of their NPP services. Decommissioning BEX should reduce the costs and complexity involved in running two of these account-to-account -account payment systems in parallel, but it also means that BEX isn't available as a backup when NPP services go down. There's going to be even less tolerance from the community for outages in the NPP, when most wages and benefit payments start going through the NPP. Improving the reliability of NPP services across the industry will be a major focus of the RBA over coming years. Now, notwithstanding these various challenges, it is appropriate that the industry has set a, a target end date for the BEX framework, and this will hope f f uh, focus industry attention and effort on the migration process. 
Given the significant opportunities and challenges associated with the BEX migration, we'll be closely monitoring industry efforts in this area. So in conclusion, the payments landscape is changing rapidly. We've got a lot of work to do to continue modernising the payment system. The government's reforms will enable us to promote safety, efficiency and competitiveness across the payments ecosystem. At the same time, industry, government and the RBA will need to work together on maintaining access to cash and transitioning from BECS to more modern payment systems. I personally look forward to continuing the cooperation between AusPayNet and the RBA as we navigate these challenges in the interests of the Australian public. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle Bullock, who's making her way to the hot seat, uh, ready for your questions. So while we're waiting for the last of your questions to come in, uh, let's see if we can take a look at the artist's impression of Michelle Bullock's speech yet. Have we got anything from Tatum Kenner coming through? Aha, here we go. Okay, this is graphic representation or graphic recording. Uh, and as I explained, it's a very creative visual way of capturing the essence of a message. So I'll just give you a little bit of time to, to take that in. Um, apparently, 60% of us identify as visual learners, which means that if you give us a visual map of a presentation, we're much more likely to remember what was in it. Um, so here's what Tatum has come up with. Michelle Bullock, what do you make of that? Do you well, reckon she's captured I can't the actually, essence? I can't actually see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite complex. It is quite complex. Have you ever had a speech um, of yours kind of recorded in that way before? N not, not quite in that way, I have to say, but uh, there's lots of these computers I see, and there's a picture of me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we've got plenty of uh, questions coming in from our audience, but uh, I've got one that I want to get in quickly first, and that is, um, how are you finding the job after two and a half months, especially the level of scrutiny? Uh, the level of scrutiny um, is, yes, um, challenging, I have to say. Um, the other thing is I've been to doing two jobs. I've been doing deputy governor and governor, so that's, that's been particularly challenging. But um, I have to say I work with a great bunch of people. Um, they are so supportive. The boards have been really, really supportive, the Reserve Bank Board, the Payment System Board. Um, so I've had so much um, uh, help, assistance, support. Um, so and the scrutiny um, I just sort of having to learn to live with. You would know all about it. That's right, no. All right, well, let's get on to questions from the payments people here. That's why they're here. Um, first one, in the context of financial inclusion, what initiatives are being discussed to ensure broader access to payment services for all segments of the population? So financial inclusion isn't sort of one of our key mandates. We don't have a mandate for that. Having said that, um, in a lot of the work we're doing here in terms of migrating from legacy payment systems to digital payment systems, we do have at, in our minds inclusion. Because, and, and this goes to the heart of the uh, cash issue and it also goes to the heart of the checks issue. Very, I suspect very few people in this room use, use a check. And I presented a check to my, uh, my daughter got a check for um, work the other day and she didn't know what to do with it. Um, but there are people who do rely on it. And so I think while we are transitioning away from legacy systems, I think it's really important that we keep in mind that we've got to bring people with us on the and, and for purposes of financial inclusion. So it's, it's not a direct mandate, but I think it's, it's got a very important um, overlay onto the work we're doing in the transition. That sort of ties in with the next question. With the push to replace BECS, will the Reserve Bank move to mandate NPP capability on all bank accounts? Well, mandate's a big, big word. Um, uh, we don't do a lot of mandating and we try not to do a lot of regulating. We, it, it really is a last resort um, for us. Um, we, we are encouraging the industry. I, I know you've got a lot on. We've got a lot on too. But to the point about... Um, moving from BEX, there is going to have to be capabilities which currently aren't there in the NPP um, as we retire BEX. So I'd like to think we won't have to mandate, but what we will be doing is um, publishing, talking about when we're not happy with progress in the industry. Um, 
We'll be talking to your executives, we'll be talking to uh, the ABA, we'll be talking to people and pushing very hard. Um, in the end, if it requires a mandate, legislation, then we'll do it, or, or not legislation so much as, as regulation, but um, we'd prefer really just to work with the industry to get it done. Okay. Can you discuss the recent CBDC case study in terms improving the efficiency and user experience of the payment sector? Um, so the recent project had a number of, of a variety of use cases. Um, one of one of my favourites actually was using CBDC um, to settle uh, cattle auctions, um, which um, from my um, rural upbringing I found quite intriguing. Um, but I think what came out of that for us was that we are still not convinced on the retail CBDC side. A lot of the very useful things that came out of the CBDC trial that we did, and, and it was quite unusual, it was a pilot, it was a real claim on the Reserve Bank, it wasn't just play money. Um, and one of the things that came out of it was really that some of these wholesale cases and particular cases where central bank digital currency could be used to settle assets, and this is why we're embarking upon this next step of looking at tokenised assets. If you tokenise assets, put them on the ledger, can you use a CBDC to make that a much more efficient process, a much more efficient settlement process, a much safer uh, settlement process? So. For me, the thing that came out of that um, particular experiment of all the case studies was that that's a sensible next direction in which to take this. I know other countries are looking at retail CBDC and we'll continue to keep in touch with that, but that's probably not our main focus for the next little while. OK, here's a question we might tackle in the big debate as well. It's an interesting one. Do we need to start reflecting on the true cost of processing cash for businesses and therefore not represented as a fee-free option for customers, while always charging customers when they use their credit card when, you know, there's no other option, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, look, it is um, a good question, and the issue with cash has always been that um, businesses don't really understand, I think, the costs of, of cash in their business. Um, uh, they are at the moment, I think, think uh, understanding it a bit more, um, but um, in the past they haven't really. Um, they've called shrinkage as their main cost, which basically means theft. Um, but really they haven't really um, internalised, if you like, the costs of processing. Um, I think what the challenge with cash is that it really does have a big community um, public's, public service sort of um, uh, aura attached to it. If you try to charge people to use cash, they're prepared to pay to get it out of an ATM, but if, if, um, if businesses started charging people to use cash, I suspect there would be um, a very big uh, backlash. Having said that, it's also true that as economists, you want people to face the prices of using particular services that reflect the cost of those services. So um, at the moment, I think we're probably in a position where um, it's very difficult to actually enforce payment for cash, but it's going to end up, what's going to happen and what does happen at the moment is that the costs end up embedded in the costs of the financial institutions that are providing the services um, and people don't face them. I think, I think it'd be a very big challenge, though, to get people to face the costs of cash. Does the Reserve Bank have any plans for a technical sandbox for fintechs and banks? Uh, this, this is another a very topical question. Um, we don't have a specific plan, but out of the one of the lessons that came out of the CBDC project that we did was that the regulatory issues were quite difficult. Um, that's, that's the fault of no regulators, it's just the way the legislation is set up. Now, what we've been observing overseas is that some countries have been um, putting in place sandboxes which allow much freer innovation to happen without running into uh, regulatory issues. So this issue popped out of the... also popped out for us after our CBDC trial. Um, 
we've been talking about this among the agencies. I'm chair of the Council of Financial Regulators now as well. And this is an issue that it's only just on our radar. Nothing's going to happen uh, tomorrow. But I think it is, it is a very valid question and it's something that we will be talking to the government about, uh, talking to Treasury about, and we'll be watching what others are doing overseas in terms of their sandboxes. On LCR, what would constitute success for the RBA? And if the goal is not achieved, could you provide details as to the regulations the RBA may put in place? So at the moment, we've got about 54%, I think, is, is enabled and actually active in LCR. Um, I don't think we can expect 100%, but somewhere in the 80s might be nice, um, really. So um, what, what are the regulations we might put in place? I don't know what they might look like. I don't know what a standard might look like in that case, but it would... It would involve some sort of uh, requirement on acquirers to actually offer LCR in some form. So mm. I don't know what the specifics would be, but I think the industry, I think you can all do a lot better. You don't need us to regulate you. You can do a lot better here. Which leads us to this question. How will the RBA balance its regulatory role while promoting innovation? What steps will it take to back new payment technologies like CBDCs and open banking? Um, we, I guess what we want to do, and this is why we don't like to regulate if we can avoid it, is we'd, we'd rather stand out and let the industry do it itself. And I think actually the NPP was a good example of this. We, um, we said we were prepared to go in and do something about this if the industry couldn't actually do anything itself. But the industry did. The industry ended up getting together and cooperating to create the NPP. And I, th I think that was a really good example of where innovation was encouraged by us, but we didn't, we didn't regulate and we didn't get in the way. We, we participated, we helped, um, but we didn't get in the way of it. So I think there is a model there which shows that we can be um, encouraging of innovation, we can help, we can... Um, we have a lot of expertise as well in the payments area ourselves, so we can help with all of this. We don't have to stand in the way. So I, th I think, you know, we've, we've got a good model here. OK, well, guess what? A question on monetary policy has slipped through. Let's go to it. The US, US CPI is tipped to be 3% tonight, keeping US rates on hold at 5.5%. How far behind the rest of the world is Australia falling in its fight against inflation? I don't think we're falling behind at all. I think we are trying to make sure that we slow the economy enough to bring inflation down to our target band, provided inflation expectations don't get out of control, and they're not at the moment. Um, we think we can do that in um, the next couple of years, and we can do that while preserving the employment <coughs> gains that we've, we've won, through the, um, won through the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. So um, I don't think... I don't think we're behind at all. I think we've taken a cautious approach and we'll continue to watch the data. OK, well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, who sent in questions. We're almost at the end of our Q&A session. So I, I just wanted to ask you, as, our, as the nation's chief economist, we're coming up to Christmas. Any Christmas message you'd like to give us and what we can look forward to in the economy next year? <laughs> now, that's a nasty question, Juanita. <laughs> <laughs> My only uh, message to people is that, look, I know everyone's worked really hard this year. I know um, certainly in this room I can speak for all of my teams and I'm quite sure for all of the other teams here. It's been a hard year. It's been a hard year for people at work. It's been a hard year for people who are dealing with rising interest rates and rising inflation. I'd like to think that we can all take some time to be with our families um, and um, hopefully things are going to get better next year. Thank you very much, Michelle Bullock. Please show your appreciation of the Reserve Bank Governor, Michelle Bullock. Thank you so much. You'd like to go? That's the way.